Hashem, the Center for Creative Photography in uh, Tucson, the Ransom Center in Austin, the Unif University of London, the Ghetto Research Institute in Los Angeles, and the British Society for the History of Science. Uh, and his, uh, the title of his spe is, uh, speech is Jews and Photography in Africa. Please. Okay, um, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank um, Adam and Janine and, um, and Aura, that is a Kaplan Center and the Dayan Center. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I, there are many connections that this is sort of bringing together for me, which is wonderful. Um, we'll call this part of the conference the Revenge of the Lit Fox. Uh, finally, we're getting some uh, uh, proper representation here. Um, Jews were tremendously overrepresented as photographers and in the photographic trades overall in Europe from the mid 19th century until the Holocaust. A corollary of this phenomena is that Jews became notable as photographers in and of Africa. Um, one thing I want to be very clear about I'm not really concerned with Jewish contributions. That is, I really, I, I should say, I don't care. But I'm not looking to say, well, this is actually what Jews did. What I'd like to do is really sort of factor in Jewish ethnic difference in the way that Joan Scott encouraged us to think about women's history. That is, how does the whole thing look different once you bring in the important differences between people or what they saw at the time as the important differences between people. So hopefully this will um, sort of shake up both Jewish history and the history of photography, at least a little bit. Um, Jews ran the gamut of photography in South Africa as a formidable, permanent Jewish settlement emerged here. But thank you. Of course, largely with origins in Lithuania. Uh, um, there is, therefore, a rich inheritance of photographs of and by South African Jewry, um, not only because they were entrepreneurial and occupied middleman type roles, but due to the fact that Jews were so disproportionate in the ranks of photographers, even in the seemingly backward Lithuanian hinterland. Indeed, I was partly inspired to come to this country as a means of learning more about the Litvak connection to photography in South Africa. Well, the current presentation, however, focuses on how Jews, as photographers, <laughs> and photography editors and writers helped to shape Africa's presentation to the world in realistic media and influenced Africa's evolving relationship with the arts and culture in the West. Although there will be some attention to photographers who are well known, <coughs> such as Ela, Camilla Koffler, Paul Strand, Robert Kappa, Alfred Eisenstadt, and Arnold Newman, I'm going to focus on two much lesser known figures, Omar Oscar Marcus, a Jew born in Berlin in 1910, who died in Mexico City in 1980, and Elliot Elisifan, a Brooklyn Jew who lived from 1911 to 1973. Marcus was one of the most important photographers of Africa in the Middle East beginning in the 1930s. But as I said, he's little remembered. Elisifan is fairly well known as a photographer for Life magazine in its prime. He also was preeminent among the individuals who took a keen interest in African art, and his African photography was a subject of a major retrospective at Washington's Museum of African Art in 2014, which was founded in no small part through his own efforts. Nearly all of those in the photography trade about whom I will speak conceived of themselves as proponents for greater autonomy human rights, and dignity for Africans, and would have fervently identified themselves as anti-racist. Peter Pollack and Helmut Gernsheim as foundational historians of photography, and Elisifan as a photographic interpreter of African culture, explicitly sought to undermine essential notions of race. This is from uh, one of Elisifan's most famous works. Um, I, I would argue that it's no coincidence that photographers such as Helmut Gernsheim, Peter Pollack, and Elliot Elisifan were on the cutting edge of the appreciation 
and collecting of African art. And this is actually um, the most important thing, I think, about what, uh, what I'll be presenting about the Lisbon. Given the evolving character of ethnic politics, however, it's not surprising that Elisaphon's role has, been a, has especially been a source of tension and controversy, which I think deserves closer scrutiny than it is so far elicited. Well, since the historical experience of Jews as photographers has been treated so lightly, it's important for scholars in the most basic sense to recount these cameramen and women and their activity. In addition to the substantial Jewish presence in photography from uh, from Lithuania to South Africa beginning in the 1880s, um, and some notable studio photographers or emigres such as Hamburg's Emil Bieber and Anne Fisher after 1933. I think there is actually quite a bit to say. This transplantation and growth of Jews in photography is not surprising, given the relationship between the burgeoning immigrant community and continuing migration, which feeds the demand for professional photography in both the immigrant and home communities. Festivities surrounding the departure of members of Lithuanian communities for South Africa, Palestine, and other destinations was often a photo-worthy occasion, marked by schools and various groups to which the emigrants belonged. It also meant that those who remained in Europe were committed to sending photos to their friends and relatives. Therefore, you had to have photography studios and photographers active on both sides. It is where people were coming from and where they were going to. In addition to studio photographers who often shot photos on site, photojournalists disseminated realistic images from Africa and the Middle East. And I say that Jews were really grossly overrepresented um, as photojournalists for a number of reasons which I can talk about later on. Although his time in Africa was limited, Omar Oscar Marcus was uh, captured the um, newly emerging African nations in the 1950s. Photographers, though, also tended to reinforce the ideological bases from which their livelihoods depended, and Marcus found himself representing the 20th Century Fund, a relatively progressive liberal NGO. Well, it was mainly the generation that succeeded the people I'm talking about here that actually challenged convention and authorities. I mean, that, that these are, say, the people who are more familiar to South Africans here, such as uh, uh, Dave Goldblatt. And this is, this is not the subject of my talk, important as it is. But prior to 1945, Africans were treated sort of along the spectrum as exotic and could, we could say somewhat odd, but I will say in the context of these publications, almost everybody was treated as odd and in a funny way, and it wasn't only Africans who were shown to be naked any chance that these publications could get. They would show white women um, naked as well, and even Jewish women. So it went along the scale from um, sort of um, uh, beautiful and human, uh, and, and I especially want to point out the pictorial press that was edited by Stéphane Laurent, um, Laurent used a number of Jewish photographers, and one of the reasons why this is hard to trace is that many of them were working illegally, that is from the late 20s through the 1930s and 40s, and very often they themselves did not want to have a byline. That is, they didn't want to have their pictures identified because, as I said, they were working illegally, and a lot of times this was done in code, and some of the Jewish photographers even took other Jewish names. And I'm, I'm going to show you what some of these were. I would argue that Stéphane Laurent was the most important photographic editor in the 1930s and 40s, actually much more important, um, say, in the founding of Life magazine, which is usually the one people talk about. Life and uh, Henry Luce actually followed, followed on from Stéphane Laurent. But I'm going to show you some images, and some of them, some of you here might think are rather risque or horrible or even obscene, but I think this is really important. This is the kind of stuff that Jewish photographers did and got paid for. Sometimes they were requested to do it. Sometimes they simply did it on spec and sold it. Okay, here's Stefan Laurent. Um, this is how Picture Post is produced. He shows himself. He's very concerned with sort of showing how he did the kind of work that he did. Um, a lot of his work in sort of the comic vein, particularly for Lilliput, was to do these kinds of uh, um, juxtapositions. And here I label this cheeky. And, here we have uh, um, an African ruler, and then we have someone in a bubble bath, and he sort of keeps the 
definitions. This is a big picture spread about hair. Um, and we have women in uh, salons in Britain. And then um, the very end of it, um, the very end is Africa. Um, and then again, he was also a, uh, um, a great fan of Camilla Koffler, who's considered one of the uh, um, one of the leading African or one of the leading animal photographers. Um, and a, a, a principal aim here, though, is to detail not only, as I said, not not only Jewish contributions, but to show how the intensive Jewish engagement with photography may have influenced perceptions of Africa and Africans, but especially, as I said, the possibility of African cultural creativity being received as part of the canon of art in the Western world itself. Okay. Um, this is, say, a representative of the kind of work that Alyssa Fon did. Well, I wouldn't expect the name Omar Oscar Marcus to mean anything to even the most avid scholars of European Jewish history and the history of photography. But Marcus has been honored by the Hebrew University of Jerusalem with an exhibition, which was actually up for quite a long time, including selections of his writing and photographs, but moreover by the establishment of a prize to recognize attempts to foster understanding between Jews and Arabs, which is really a formidable gesture. In some respects, this is appropriate. As a press photographer, Marcus is most famous for being the first non-Muslim to photograph prayer at Mecca. Among Arabs in numerous settings, he was able to pass as a Muslim, uh, in part due to his facility in Arabic, which he denigrated as being limited, but everybody else said he was absolutely amazing in this. It was uh, obviously very effective. He did, in fact, have great respect for Arabs and their diverse cultures, and many of his observations of the Yishuv, Jewish settlement in Palestine, and Zionist-Arab relations turned out to be very prescient. He believed that there was no possibility of a permanent solution of the Arab-Zionist, later Arab-Israeli conflict if Jews did not make a determined effort to understand and appreciate their Arab counterparts, which meant learning their language and language, languages and customs. He retained the name Omar for his entire life. The potted biography of Marcus by Hebrew University, which no longer appears, actually maybe it's come back, um, it was on the website and then it was taken off, um, states that Omar Oscar Marcus was a press photographer who gained fame in the 1930s for his fascinating photos of North Africa and Arab countries, some of them taken at great personal risk. His pictures of the Middle East are full of gripping tales of kings and princes he met on his many travels on behalf of the Associated Press. World fame came to him in 1935 with the publication of his photos of worshippers at Mecca, which was close to Westerners. When he became known as a photographer in the Arab world, he took up the name Omar, which sounds Arabic and is made up of the first syllables of his first and last names, Omar Marcus. I actually don't quite believe that, but that's another story. Marcus was born in Berlin in 1910. After many years of wandering around the world, he settled in Mexico, where he taught the art of color movie photography at the university. He was killed in a road accident in Mexico in 1980 and buried in Jerusalem. In 1984, the Omar uh, Oscar Marcus Fund for Understanding and Peace between Arabs and Jews was established at Hebrew University's Truman Institute, a workshop for Arab students in rural areas in their first year of university student studies was set up in the framework for the fund with the aim of helping them adjust to university life in the urban environment. In addition, study stipends were set up by the fund in partnership with the education ministry as a prize for Jewish or Arab students who wrote term papers on the subject of Jewish-Arab relations. As a Jew, as a man involved with the culture of the Middle East, and as a citizen of the world, Omar Mar Marcus saw great importance in working toward peace, at peace in general, between Jews and, and Jews and Arabs in particular. A number of, let of his letters in the present exhibition deal with this concern. Well, end quote. Another press release mentions that he was the descendant of the 18th century Rabbi Akiva Eger, and that his family's history in Berlin could be traced back several generations. Well, there's nothing either overtly incorrect or objectionable about the characterization of Marcus by the press office of Hebrew University. This depiction, however, reveals only a few facets of an extremely complicated 
individual and his career, and I think in some ways he's actually much more, even more significant, but in different ways than they say. Um, elsewhere, I've reflected on how his profession as a photographer, cinematographer, and television cameraman was influenced, both helped and occasionally hindered by his identity as a German Jew, eventually a German Jewish refugee, and later an English and Scottish expatriate. He became both an Anglophile and an intense Scotch patriot. He was still working as a press photographer into the 1970s, supplying pictures with some of the same papers that had employed him 40 years earlier, and perhaps more remarkably, into the 1960s, he was still relying on his knowledge of local languages and customs in order to obtain the desired story in pictures. He was still sort of going uh, into various hinterlands to get interesting pictures. He was a fairly astute observer of the world around him, although he did not seem to possess much savvy in understanding the sense that others made of him. He was terrible at figuring out what people actually thought of him, which was in some ways really quite sad. His writings also are intriguing because he was a Jew operating in what may be considered uh, heavily Jewish fields, yet he remained an outsider even though some aspects of his attitude and experience were quite typical of his larger cohort. One of my motivations over telling Marcus's story is that it is not simply a tale of notable accomplishment. Despite the success story propounded by Hebrew University in, recent, in a recent article in the journal German History by Annette von Winkel, arguing that Jewish emigre photographers tended to fare well due to their professional networks, for much of his life Marcus had a hard time making ends meet and his relations with friends and colleagues were tense and strained. His family, which he may have taken for granted, apparently did not play a major role in his life. Oh, okay. Uh, um, I'm going to be at it. I'm getting. So part of the reason for Marcus's lack of recognition in photography, cinematography, and television is he did not conform to the informal codes of his time. Let me put it this way. To be a press photographer usually meant being really macho. You know, you would chase after women, you would drink, you would gamble. Um, I think most likely he was a homosexual. I don't know for sure. He was, in some ways, a very straight-laced um, kind of figure. In some ways, the opposite of someone like Robert Kappa, uh, certainly very different from, um, from Alfred Eisenstadt, even though Eisenstadt uh, um, was married. But it was a, again, it was a very difficult life. But what he did, which is most important for us here, oops. Um, this is this is from Eisenstadt and Robert Kappa. Sorry. Um, he gave us a series of images of Africa and Africa's modernization that were not only shown by the fund that he worked for, but these wound up, up being repeated literally all over the world. Lots of other NGOs took these images. These appeared in the press. These appeared all over. What he tried to show that Africa was changing, it was modernizing. At the same time, he tried to show respect for traditional culture. He tried to show they were engaged in, in scientific education, that it was this world that was very mixed. And even specifically, he made an effort to show respect for the different religions, which included Muslims. Okay, what I want to do is go very quickly through Alfred Eisenstadt and, uh, or excuse me, through Elisaphon. And I want to read something at the end, which in some ways it is, really quite, um, is really quite sad. Okay, this is an image of Elisabeth that appeared fairly recently in an exhibition about black photographers in the United States, about African American photographers. And uh, this is actually a very complicated picture, both with, uh, um, both with Marcus and Elisabeth, in that African Americans were extremely important in their lives and how they conceived of the, of the world and also Africa. Okay, this is part, this is a photograph from the most recent exhibition of Elliot Lissifons, and I'm going to just run through a couple of his other images. This is very interestingly, one of the articles that sort of trashed Lissifon uh, in saying, no, he's still, he's the same old colonials that we've always seen before, made a point of saying that the Jewish photographer uh, Arnold Newman actually got it right. If you look at Arnold Newman's photographs of Africa, these are actually much more representative of Africa than um, Elisabeth.
Okay. Um, hopefully, I will. I'm not going to take up uh, um, too much too much time with this, but this is a, a really important document, and I think that it touches on a lot of things that are really quite significant with ongoing conflicts between black people and white people and um, Jews and, um, and Africa and how to deal with African culture. In 1972, after, uh, um, in, the wake of a, uh, um, in the wake of a Westinghouse broadcasting series, Black African Heritage, um, the writer who everyone here knows, Maya Angelou, wrote a very sharp critique of this work um, it was published in the New York Times, and this is the response of um, this is the response of Elliot Elisaphan. I found Maya Angelou's article. For years, we hated ourselves from April 16, 1972, which refers to my Westinghouse broadcasting series, Black African Heritage, both both complimentary and disturbing. Since Miss Angelou is an outstanding and extremely articulate Black American, her thoughts are particularly important. Ms. Angelou states that the culture of Africa is not caught only in masks and dances, tribal chiefs, and musical instruments. This is surprising since she narrated the thir third program, The Slave Coast, in which we showed, among other subjects, weaving, pottery making, wood carving, bronze casting, and architecture, as well as song and dance. No one program can do everything, but I believe that there are many unspoken references and effects which came through to the audience. For instance, the sequence of, on the talking drums of the Yoruba not only demonstrated a sophisticated versatility in music and communications, but also the respect the people had for their tribal chief. <laughs> Miss Angelou has forgotten the sequence um, on the coast of Ghana, uh, whence millions of, st of slaves were shipped to the Americas. She also ignores our inclusion of the women warriors of Abami, a feminine phenomena in African history. We made four films for as wide an audience as possible. We meant to entertain people and hope to inspire them with a new appreciation of Afri Africa in general. How many would watch a professional discussion of matrilineal inheritance, which Miss Angela thinks is mo most important? If I could make a documentary film for a foundation or university, but not a film for general telev television audiences, I would have done this. Okay, my main point is that, um, although in some ways this is very sad, it was a dialogue of the deaf. It was a dialogue of the deaf. And this is partly because Elliot Elisavon himself was not explaining very well what he was doing and why he was doing it. One of the things that he was trying to do, as was Peter Pollock, as was Helmut Gernstein, is they were trying to bring African culture into the Western canon. And their way of doing it, sort of as Jews and as people of their time, was to figure out a way to monetize it to figure out a way that the people who are making it could actually make money from it. And one of their great gauges of culture was, is it going to sell in the auction houses? You know, is it actually going to become famous? And also from their perspective, they knew that most people were not going to buy African masks or doors or various things, but the way that they could access it would be through photography and that really good photography would be able to capture it. So in, in some ways you could say, well, they were sort of serving their own interests, but I think um, sort of surrounding this was a desire to really bring it into the mainstream of culture and have it appreciated in a way that they themselves understood, and there would be something that, say, the people who created it and the whole surrounding culture would be able to get something from it. But unfortunately, I think up to this point, this really hasn't been terribly well understood. But again, I think this represents something of both a Jewish and an African phenomena that we should pay some attention to. Thank you very much.